All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, per participating in the uh, LTAP Managing Utility Cut presentation here this morning. Uh, this is a uh, typically a four hour course that we put on uh, through the LTAP program, and we've condensed this down to about 20 to 25 minutes here this morning. So I'm going to only be covering some of the general topics today about, uh, you know, in some of the components to uh, uh, putting together a, a utility cut program for your municipality. So, um, you know, I really do expect questions to come up from this because I won't be getting into all the detail that we typically do, but um, I did want to let you know that this is just a, a small little teaser, uh, really, of what the, the overall program is that, uh, that we have through the LTAP program. Uh, just a real quick introduction to the program. If you're not familiar with it, uh, we provide classroom uh, training. Uh, lately, we've been doing the, the online version, such as this. Uh, we also provide technical support. So, uh, you know, if you're looking to put together a, a utility cut program, program after this, really reach out to us. We provide all of this free of charge uh, through this program. We can do it through the phone, provide as much support as you need, uh, provide you with some documents, some samples, uh, and uh, but also for any other issue, like if you're dealing with some winter maintenance issues or some drainage issues or things like that, uh, we have technical experts as part of the program that can give you a hand. Uh, the website is uh, up above, and that's a quick little sc uh, screenshot of what you'll see. If you don't have an account, you can go on there and set one up. Uh, it's all free of charge, so uh, feel free to take advantage of that great resource. Uh, we have a ton of information on there, so there's a lot of technical documents, there's newsletters, uh, a lot of good stuff that really helps you to, um, you know, uh, you know, get into the topic that you're looking for. Uh, so the topic that we're talking about here today is uh, again managing utility cuts, and you know I think you know when you start thinking about uh, a utility cut program, uh, you know, really putting together a formal program for your community. You know, you, you have to really start off with that, the big question, and that's why are you doing this? Um, you know, it, this is a prime example in this picture here. Uh, it, this, it, this picture probably says about a thousand words to all of us. If you've ever run across a uh, an unimproved utility cut uh, like this, uh, this vehicle looks like it, it may have run over this a couple times as it's missing its hubcaps already on on both tires, right? So, uh, but why do we do that? Um, it's really for these four reasons here. And we're doing it to, you know, ensure that the asset that we have, uh, our investment in the road, uh, that we're maintaining the structural integrity of that of that asset. Um, there's so much water and debris that's saturating into the sub base here. In this picture, you can see you know, this is a good example. That stone is kind of acting as a as an ag agent to allow water to get deeper down into our road base. And eventually, all around this cut, if this isn't improved, uh, you're going to start seeing potholes, and you're and you're really weakening uh, the road surface and what's underneath uh, in its entirety. You know, the second aspect is safety. You know, if you're riding on this road at night and you and you come across this and it's it's not very well marked and you bang into that really sharp curb um, you know that could cause this vehicle to uh, you know go errant and uh, you know strike you know into another vehicle or uh, damage the vehicle itself uh, so you know the safety aspect to the traveling public uh, is another reason why we want to consider this uh, third is the liability aspect you know we we would have permitted someone uh, even if we're not managing this to perform this cut across our roadway. Um, there's certainly an, an opportunity for us to be named in, in a lawsuit or in, into you know, some claim of some kind with an insurance company uh, to the damage that might occur to this vehicle here. Uh, so we want to reduce our liability by putting together a really strong program. Um, the fourth one, and maybe this is pretty obvious, is the public relations aspect of this. We really want to make sure that we're, you know, we're doing the right thing by our public and we're putting to, you know, a program in place that does not permit these types of uh, issues to linger. So there's going to be four things that we're going to talk about here today uh, briefly. Uh, one is the program development. I'm going to spend a lot of time really talking about the ordinance because that's really where the program originates. Uh, the next part we'll talk about is inspections. After you have the ordinance in place, there needs to be an inspection you know, program aspect that needs to be managed. Uh, we have rules and regulations and specifications that we'll talk about as well as part of that inspection process. Uh, and lastly is the program implementation. 
Um, this is, uh, you know, sometimes this can be the hardest part is getting this program uh, off the ground. But if you think through it thoughtfully and, you, you know, you, you really put the time into, you know, getting all the players involved, it can make it, you know, run that much smoother. So those are the four areas that we're going to talk about. So let's talk about some key elements of the ordinance itself. Uh, you know, obviously we're going to have an applicant uh, that we need to identify and really define uh, in our in our ordinance. Uh, and this is important uh, when you think about who's involved in uh, that utility, you know, in cutting that you you know utility you know, that utility crossing. Uh, is it the utility themselves that's doing the work? Uh, is it one of the authorities that might be operating within your community, and uh, or is it a contractor? You know, when you think about not if if you don't ask for or know uh, who the applicant is, uh, and in that last picture that we saw in the opening slide, there, um, you wouldn't know who to actually contact or who was responsible uh, for you to have to go back after to make sure that that work gets done. You also wouldn't know who should be submitting that application and their contact information in the event there's an emergency, uh, as well as who should be providing the in insurance or the, the, you know, the certificates of liability that kind of protects you uh, from their work that they would have performed. The next part of the ordinance that we want to you know, focus on is, uh, is, is really the application itself, right? What information uh, is it that we want to look for, that we want to request that the applicant uh, put onto that form itself? You know, there's going to be some uh, information that's going to be requested on there that um, you know, will be identified on a drawing. Um, there's going to be some contact information. There's going to be numbers that you might be requesting for the size of the opening or the distance from the edge of the road or from the center of the road. Um, so the form itself, whether it's online uh, or if it's a paper form, um, is, is going to be important for us to call out what information should be on it. And our ordinance is going to help us uh, define what that information is. Another component of the application is how much time you're going to be leaving yourself for the uh, review of that application. You know, sometimes these uh, requests can be a little complicated and you want to make sure you're giving yourself enough time uh, by ordinance to review the applicant's material. So when they submit that application, you don't just want to say we're going to have a 24 hour turnaround time or a same day turnaround time, even though you may be able to do that if it's a simple application. Uh, and you certainly could do that if it's a simple application, but you want to give yourself enough time for those more complicated applications that might involve you having to go and research uh, certain uh, inspections that might require additional fees or something like that. Uh, so again, give yourself enough time. Uh, the next item that we want to talk about is the administration uh, of the, um, uh, you know, of the program itself. Um, the ordinance should call out the ability for you to assess fees and what those fees are. Um, maybe it just references a fee schedule, so you don't have to get too detailed as far, you know, and have to change the ordinance every time uh, you want to adjust the fees. Uh, but fees should be identified in the ordinance as a component. The next is a registration aspect uh, for those utilities that are operating within your community. Uh, this would involve, uh, you know, your uh, ability to know uh, who those utilities are, uh, have an annual update of their uh, contacts in, in their information, and, uh, and that would save a lot of time on the application review uh, that you would need to conduct later on when the, when the permit requests start coming in. This also would eliminate the need for them to constantly be handing you insurance uh, certificates of liability uh, or other methods of financial security when they're doing work. Um, this is a, a big benefit to those utilities as far as uh, not having to constantly you know, add that information on the application if it's on file already. The next item is going to be degradation fees. Now, this is different than some of the typical fees that we might be discussing uh, as far as the application fee and maybe a simple street opening. Uh, degradation fees, we get into this a, a, in a little bit where we talk about, you know, the newer your road, possibly the more you should be charging for an opening in your road. Uh, and over the life of that road, those fees degrade over time as the road itself starts to age and become um, older. We'll talk about that in a little bit, how, how those are calculated. And the last thing is emergency permits. 
um, you'll you want to include some opportunity, you know, uh, for emergency permits to be used and issued. Uh, but you also want to make sure that we're identifying emergency permits so that uh, they aren't necessarily a, um, a, a you, you know abused. Uh, you, you know, we want to structure them in the ordinance so that they're not necessarily abused, and that regular permits are more the norm. Emergency permits should be the exception. The next thing your your ordinance should talk about is the inspection process itself. Um, your, you know, it should reference specifications. Uh, it should reference how long the permit is good for, so that the inspector knows that, you know, this permit expires in three months or six months. Uh, but a term itself should be identified uh, in that inspection process, uh, as well as restoration. Uh, so restoration is what that what that cut is going to look like in its finished state. Um, lastly, the, the last component to, that, that you should be thinking about whenever you're uh, thinking of a program is the enforcement of this. Um, the permit itself really just gets them in the door and lets you know that work is going to be taking place. Enforcement allows you to uh, the ability to go out and inspect that work. It allows you to follow up with the person who did that work uh, and to put them on notice if it's not done correctly or to revoke permits uh, with, uh, with means uh, that allows you to move forward. So uh, I know one of the big questions is, well, do you have a sample of, a, of an application? Uh, here's a here's a good example. This one was actually pulled from uh, that, a, that a lot of communities use that that uh, are part of PSATS, uh, Second Class Township Association. Um, this is an application for township highway occupancy permit. Um, and you can see on here where, where there's a, a block on here for the applicant's information. Uh, but right above that is instructions. Um, there's instructions on what needs to be completed on here. Uh, there's an, a section on here of where the location is going to take place, the type of applicant that this is, if it's an individual or corporation, uh, the anticipated start and completion dates, uh, such a key component to any application. Some of the required data on here talks about the uh, the road surface that's going to be improved, what the width and length is, uh, the distance from the center line, the distance from the edge of the road. Um, so a lot of key information is on here. Uh, one of the other items on here that I like to point out is the fact that there's an, uh, a, a few lines on here for a description of the work. Um, this allows them to also attach uh, uh, additional paperwork like a, a, tra a traffic uh, plan or a work zone uh, layout. Uh, this could show what uh, safety equipment they're going to be using, who's going to be on the job, how long they're expecting to be on the job. Uh, this is where you get a lot more information and allows the applicant to really explain the work that they're doing. Uh, at the bottom, you can see is the area for the municipality to uh, to complete this area here. It talks about the fee. There's an notice how it says application fee. Then there's inspection fee, and then it says total. Um, so you know when we're talking about fees, um, you know there's a cost for you to administer this program, and there's also a cost for you to have to inspect, um, you know, the road while the work is, uh, you know, being completed. Uh, so and after it's after it's done. So just wanted to call out those particular things. Um, also below there it talks about is, is a plan required for this and uh, you know was the plan satisfactory that was submitted as well as a traffic uh, control plan. Uh, just one example of some things that are on a uh, typical application. You know, a fee schedule should accompany this uh, so that the applicant understands what their fees might be. Uh, and you may have a, a form that you want them to complete their uh, traffic plan on, uh, something that's simple that you can reference uh, quickly if you put it into your own uh, format. Uh, you know, the question always comes up is, uh, you know, does an applicant, if I if I deny a street opening uh, or, uh, you know, utility cut application, um, you know, can I revoke that? Can I deny an application? You you can. You should have you know uh, you know reasons you know for that. You should have a good solid base of reasons. Maybe the work wasn't done to, to your satisfaction in a prior job. Maybe they they didn't submit the proper um, you know financial securities in the past. Um, there could be you know you know a couple reasons. But you should always give the applicant the opportunity for uh, to dispute uh, what your denial is. And uh, and there's a form to do that with. It's provided by PennDOT here in this particular form. And I always like to point that out because. Because if you're ever going to suspend someone or put them on probation or or do something like that, you should always give them a a way to um, you know get out of that. 
So talking about fees, uh, getting back to fees, this is always one of the one of the bigger topics. You know, there's there's really two ways for you to consider uh, implementing fees for uh, your program. You know, the first is is something that's very uh, simple, and that is you know a one fee to cover all the costs, um, and uh, and typically this is the application fee, or uh, you know in some organizations they say this is all we're going to charge. We're going to charge a fifty dollar uh, general issuance fee, and that's going to allow us to, um, you know, know where the work is taking place. Um, it's also going to give us the ability to issue emergency permit cards. And so that example on the top section there is 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 one way to approach it. The second way is through a system of fees or a fee structure that has a permit fee, an inspection fee, a degradation fee. Um, it's a little bit more complicated. It, it, it requires a little bit more management of the program uh, and enforcement of the program. And so that's what we're going to, that's kind of what we're going to talk about here, some of the complicated um, instances uh, of, of what a, a system of fees looks like. So here's an example of a fee schedule. And again, this one was taken from PennDOT. Um, uh, this shows uh, several, you know, they, uh, you know, several different fees on here. So if you look at the top, there's, you know, utilities. There's an application fee of fifty dollars. They have driveway fees listed on here. Uh, but if you look down right around uh, four fifty nine point four, surface openings, um, where they say opening and pavement, opening and shoulder, opening outside pavement and shoulder, and each one of those has a different fee associated with it. Um, and and so they are going to be charging a different fee based on where the work is taking place. So when an applicant is submitting this information, they're also submitting on a drawing where the work's taking place so that you can kind of identify where that where that work is and what the appropriate fees will be. Now you can also see uh, on here where they talk about the different inspection fees. So there's inspection fees that might be done if this is under work is being done underground, if the work is a surf, just being done at the surface, if it's being done above ground, um, you might ask, well, what work could be done above ground and how can I charge them a utility uh, fee for this. Well, when when a utility installs guy wires or when they install poles uh, within the right of way, um, this is whenever those types of fees come into play, the above ground uh, fees, different crossings. Um, and there's different tests that might be required as part of your inspection uh, that you might need to charge extra for, like you know getting a seismograph performed or having test holes done uh, to perform that the, um, that the work was done uh, properly. So degradation fees always come up because everyone hears, oh, so I can charge more money if my road's newer, uh, or you know, or I can charge a, a different fee uh, as part of my, um, you know, my utility cut program. Yes, you you can do that. It is permitted to, uh, you know, to charge a a a a fee based upon the age of your road. And I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it, you know, in in, in quick terms. Um, you know, as your your road ages, um, you know, the the cost Cost of your road improvements, uh, you know, slowly increase. Um, however, right after you pave that road is whenever that road is at its is at its prime. And so every year that that road ages, it starts to deteriorate more and more. And and the 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 impact to the from the utility cut that you're able to charge starts going lower and lower uh, based on the age of the road. So this is you know associated with that deterioration of that. Uh, it's a sliding scale. So if you can think of that. Right, so the newer the road, the more money that you can charge. Um, you know, you know, there could be a, a minimum charge that's associated with uh, any type of road opening, you know, regardless of what what the uh, age of the road is as well. Uh, that can be worked into that. But let's talk about degradation fees and what that fee uh, looks like. So in this example, a utility is going to come through and they're going to perform a, a cut that's three by nine uh, feet in your uh, in your road surface. So that's going to be uh, uh, nine square yards, uh, and or, or rather, so so three times nine is twenty-seven uh, divided by nine is three, uh, and and you would take that if it was done in that first year, uh, it would be one hundred and fifty dollars times three. Uh, because that's the size of what you're charging per square yard. Um, so let's go through that example again. So three times nine is 27. Uh, you divide that by nine equals three. Three times 150 
equals four hundred and fifty dollars. So in that example, that that cost, and you can see that if if you went down and you looked in those years six through ten, if they performed that same cut in a in a road that was in its seventh year, you would only charge one hundred dollars per square yard. So in this example, you would only charge three hundred dollars for that opening uh, because that road had degraded over time to that uh, to that degree. So this is just one example of how it's done. Again, those rates are are set by you. Uh, you determine what those rates are are going to be. <coughs> so, uh, you know, when we talk about you know mo moving on to the the inspection side, um, you know, a, an inspector is going to need to have. Uh, you know, certain knowledge. They're going to have to have knowledge of the application that was submitted. They're going to have to have access uh, to the administrative, you know, folks who can make decisions, um, but they also need to have a working knowledge of what it is that they're inspecting and where the reference tools are, um, you know, for them to make inspection decisions on, um, you know, and that's going to start with, you know, their ordinance and regulations and state statutes. Um, understanding what the ordinance says, remember, and we talked about early on some of the key components that it you know you need to have in there some very clear references to specs um you know what your road restoration profile might look like um you know in, in a detail as to how a utility is supposed to restore you know shoulders on your roads um so that the inspector while he's out there and he's watching this work take place uh, while that work is is being done he can reference these particular documents um it needs to have a, 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 a working knowledge of, of one call regulation Regulations uh, while they're out there so that they can um, know that the job is being done safe and that they are following the rules and regulations of anyone who puts a, sh you know, who, who, who does excavation across these roads um, needs to have a, a very good knowledge of that. Next, they need to understand, you know, what their responsibilities are uh, for uh, uh, temporary traffic control measures. So uh, where to reference that stuff in the MUTCD and various PennDOT publications. They should have an understanding of OSHA regulations and, and have the ability to, you know, if they needed to shut a job down, do they have the authority to do that? Um, you know, if trenching and shoring is needed so that, you know, further damage isn't taking place against, your, you know, your road or uh, that, that, that they're making sure that the crew is safe. Uh, as part of that, um, uh, you know, as part of that operation, you know, and lastly, I just listed blasting regulations because that that is something that takes place in in Pennsylvania a fair amount of time. Uh, we have a lot of rock that contractors have to work through, um, and and sometimes they, you know, we in our own ordinances we we reference, you know, what different blasting regulations are. Um, so when uh, you know, following along those lines with the the inspections, you know, backfilling and compaction is going to be something that is going to be so important for them to um, to have a, a, a good solid knowledge on. Um, they should they should know that the that the contractors using proper material when they're backfilling, that it goes in in layers, that they're using the right equipment to put this down, and that the density is is tested correctly. Um, they should have the tools of the trade to be able to do that as well uh, as part of as part of their program. I mentioned before, you know, about a you know a typical you know section that an inspector can reference. This is a really good example, you know, of of what that a, a typical backfill section would look like. So um, the inspector should have this you know with them while they're inspecting that particular uh, utility cut being restored, and uh, be able to reference if there's ever a, a question, you know, as to how how deep a, a backfill section should be. They should be able to reference that uh, with authority with with a document like this. You know, after restoration, um, you know, you, you know, like in that first example, when we saw that van going over that open, unimproved utility cut, we'll say, um, you know, if if there would be asphalt on top of there, and and perhaps that that um, you know area where that tire was about to go down to, and damage their vehicle, if if there was a you know some asphalt in there, the utility would have been made to put uh, in their in their color code. Uh, so if it's the gas company in yellow, they would have been required to put their you know in in their numbers you, you know how um, uh, you know what's underneath there the color of their utility. And, and their name as to who who owns that patch. 
Um, this is something that that we start to uh, it, this helps you manage these cuts, um, you know, for a length of up to two years. Um, the paint should be maintained as well by that um, contractor who maintained that uh, or who did the restoration work. Um, you know, th these uh, this is something that I get asked about uh, a lot about. Hey, how how do I know what cut or who made that? You know, a year later, this is one way that's recommended. They put the month and the year uh, in their colors and um, and then you're able to reference okay that was a gas utility improvement I you know I, I know who, who I need to reference there so the inspector's work isn't done until the project's closed out right so they should be looking at the right of way, making sure that it's restored properly, that everything's, uh, that the site is cleaned up, any kind of, um, you know, uh, supplies or materials is removed from the site, uh, that a punch list of items are completed, uh, if, if that's how, how they, you know, kept their running total, that the adjacent pavement condition is improved as well, that they're, that they're not seeing any uh, issues with that, and that any kind of ENS controls or uh, best management practices um, that, that if there's controls that were put in place that can be removed that they should be, but that uh, best management practices should be been implored during uh, to make sure that drainage is maintained throughout that. Again, we talked about you know fee schedules. Uh, when we're talking about the inspection side, though, you know sometimes the inspector can be um, you know have the ability to issue time extensions, and perhaps there's an additional fee with that, or there needs to be a revision to the work that was done. So an HOP revision might need to be considered and perhaps there's a fee that's associated. We talked about some of these additional fees to cover the inspection work that's taking place out there. Um, again, these fees, you can talk with your township engineer or borough engineer uh, and discuss these with them about, you know, what appropriate fees look like if you need to bring a company in uh, to help, you know, manage this particular utility improvement or restoration work. Um, lastly, we're going to talk about is uh, is really the um, implementation of the program. And again, I think that the more thought that you put into how your program is going to be implemented, uh, and what the component, you know, the various components are that need to go into this up front, um, I think the easier that it, it, it would be, you know, could go for you. Um, so we talked about that, you know, having a draft ordinance uh, in place that's going to include your specifications as well as your fee structure. You know, there's a lot of these that are available to you online. Um, you know, I, again, I can certainly help you if, if you're looking for some of these to, to send you some examples that we have. Um, but, the, you know, having a working knowledge of, uh, you know, what your ordinance structure might be and what you need to include in it up front will really help that part of the process go a lot uh, a lot better and it'll probably also save you a couple bucks with your solicitor. Um, the next is to think about you know your personnel requirements that are going to be needed to actually implement this program. Um, this is definitely not a program that you can set it and forget it right. This is going to be one that requires you to have an active role in both in the administering of this program as well as in the enforcement and closeout of those permits um, that are issued. So you know you want to be thinking about who in your organization or or what contracted service could you use to accomplish the goal of managing this program? Um, there should be some internal coordination that you have uh, with your uh, with your staff uh, and and you know whether that's with your codes department or public works uh, operations, even your police department and fire department can play a role in this uh, in the enforcement aspect of this. Um, you know, when, you, we're, when we're talking about the degradation fees, um, you know, you really need to, to be able to keep an active running list of your paving program. So having that five-year history uh, ongoing of your paving program, so looking back five years and, and depending on how far you back, how far back you want to go, but up to 10 years back, um, you want to be able to coordinate this program with that because if you're going to go the degradation fee route, you've got to constantly be keeping that thing updated. Um, so that you know what your first year and second year and third year fees are going to be for those particular roads. Um, you know, I list this one last, but I, it's certainly not least is, you know, engaging your elected officials and utility providers as well as contractors. You know, you, you know, if you're starting to think about putting a program like this together, there's a good chance that your elected officials are starting to get bombarded with phone calls, right, especially this time of year, whenever those utility cuts can't have a permanent patch put on them, um, you know, and, and maybe they're starting to get called about hey get some cold you know somebody needs to put cold patch in that and uh, you know in that trench um but you know we want to be engaging our elected officials letting them know about what this program consists of what the nuances of it are the fact that it's a you know a, a, you know it needs 
it's a managed program that it's going to be, um, and uh, as well as our utility providers. You know, th they are already, um, if you don't have a program in place now, I assure you that, you know, your neighbors or your not too distant neighbors have a program in place. These are pretty prevalent across the Commonwealth. Um, you know, a lot, you know, some of the, the, the things that I get um, told is that, well, if I put a program like this together, all our utility rates are going to go up. Um, that's typically not the case. <laughs> um, uh, these guys work. This is part of doing business. They expect you to have to inspect their operations, uh, and they, they know there's a, a fee associated with that. And uh, as well as contractors, um, they they understand that they they typically have to go into a municipality and get these uh, applications submitted and uh, and approved before they can start that work. Um, one last point to this is that you know one uh, uh, a lot of communities will will typically uh, utilize the PA one call ticket system. Uh, you know, keep a running total on what tickets occurred within their uh, municipal boundaries as a way to kind of. Uh, quality control their utility cut program, and uh, even if they if they missed a permit up front, uh, if they missed an applicant applying for a cut, um, they would catch up on that at the end of the month and, and ensure that that uh, person who performed that work still filled out an application uh, even after the fact, so that that process starts to get ingrained and that they don't miss the opportunity uh, to really have that security for their assets uh, in that uh, in that instance. Um, so. Those are really um, all of, you know, that's the Reader's Digest version of managing utility cuts. Again, this is a four-hour program that we have at the LTAP program. Uh, we really get into a lot of detail on, on, on every one of those topics that I covered as well as a, a bunch more. Uh, so if you're interested, please feel free to go online onto that website here that's listed um, and, um, and sign up for the full class. Um, I thank you guys so much for um, participating uh, here this morning. And uh, at this time, I'll take any questions.